In our last lesson, we discussed essentially what became the birth of our nation's first two major parties, essentially the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. One party who believed that the national government should have more power to rule over the states, and the other who wanted the states to retain more sovereign or more ruling power over themselves. Well, lo and behold, like we discussed in last unit, at this point in American history and throughout the American Revolution, our government functioned under our first constitution, the Articles of Confederation. But as you saw in the lesson about that document, there were a lot of issues that the Articles of Confederation either didn't broach or take care of, or in some cases made some issues for our country. So this leads to a very hot summer in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where our Congress realizes that they have a hard choice to make. Should they basically try to amend the Articles of Confederation the way it's written? Or do we start over and create a new government document under which the people and the country will function? This is a situation, guys, where you need to understand that not all battles are waged in battlefields. Sometimes they happen in essentially the enclosure of four walls. And so this brings us to the story of what we now call the four major compromises in the creation of the United States Constitution. So let's look at this issue by issue. Issue number one, how will the states and people be represented in this new government? Long story short, how do we figure out how to count the people and the population in order for us to correctly represent ourselves in government. Well, with that being said, there were two major schools of thought or plans. The first one, the Virginia plan, was written by a man named Edmund Randolph. Now his idea is that we would create a Congress that was bicameral or two houses. The lower house would be your House of Representatives and your upper house, your Senate. Now, with that being in place, representation in both houses would be based on state population. So the problem with that idea was that in general, that meant that large states that had larger populations would be much more highly represented in Congress, meaning that the little states had a lot to lose. Now, if we look at the map presented down below, you can see that under the Virginia plan, based on today's numbers, how many um, votes in Congress each state would have gained or lost by today's standard. All right. So if we look at Colorado, for example, which is right there, we would have had no change. But states like New York, Pennsylvania, all right, would actually have quite a number of votes to lose, whereas Texas and Florida would gain votes now in the representative house. But that also means that states that only have one with a very small population would have a lot less say in any vote taken in Congress. The second plan that was presented was a plan by William Patterson known as the New Jersey Plan. Now under the New, Jer Jer oh, under the New Jersey Plan, you would see what's known as a unicameral or one house situation. Representation would be based on equality, meaning each state would get exactly one representative in this new system. Now, this was actually very similar to the system that we already had in place under the Articles of Confederation. Now, unlike the Virginia plan, this plan actually favored small states since their votes would not be swallowed up by all the larger states. All right. A state like, say, uh, Montana would have an equal voice as, say, a state like Texas. Now, the plan that would end up being picked would be actually presented by Roger Sherman and become known as the Connecticut Compromise or the Great Compromise. It is actually referenced to this day, guys, as that concept. Now, the Great Compromise is exactly what we see today in our system. All right, it creates a bicameral legislator where we see an upper house Senate based on a system of equality where every state received two senators. Now, the senators, then serve six-year terms. The lower house, your house of representatives, would be based on a state's population. Essentially, a representative for a state would be assigned for every 30,000 people that were counted in the population. And these guys would serve a total of 
two-year terms. Well, great. That brings up issue number two, which is if we're going to count people for the sake of population and representation, how will slaves count towards a state's representation? Understand, guys, that during this early period of American history, southern states tend to have populations that were very close to evenly split or at times even outnumbered by their enslaved population. And so for the southern states, they felt that this was going to become a sticky issue. All right. What they wanted was for enslaved people to count. So basically, when counting a state population, enslaved individuals would count just as much as a free person would. So if that state had, say, a free man, woman population of 30, and they had a population of enslaved people at 30, then both of those groups would be evenly counted. Now, of course, this gave a lot of favor to slave states, and in the end would give slave states more representatives in the House. Now, our northern states, on the other hand, wanted that slaves did not count when determining a state's population. Because as far as the northern states were concerned, and this is going to sound fairly inhumane, if the South could count their enslaved people, which they considered to be property, then why couldn't the North count their horses and cattle as well? Now, I understand that by modern context, so our time period in history, this feels very, very wrong. Guys, understand that during this time period, Although the northern states may not have had slavery as a legal institution in their states, the fact is more often than not, people did look upon enslaved individuals as being property or the same value as their horse and cattle. So the compromise came from Roger Sherman. He actually recommended something known as the three-fifths compromise. So in essence, each slave would count as three-fifths of a person when determining a state population for representation purposes. So if you look at the graphic down below, you'll notice that there are five Caucasian individuals in the top row and five enslaved individuals in the bottom row. Per this compromise, all five of the Caucasian individuals would count as part of the population. In the bottom figure, you'll notice that two of them have been X'd out. So essentially, for every five enslaved individuals presented, three would get counted toward the population. So for example, if a state had 50,000 slaves, their population count would actually be allowed to be bumped an additional 30,000, which is essentially an extra representative for their state or an extra vote in the House of Representatives. So issue three, guys, is actually quite the interesting concept because as far as you know, our nation's capital is Washington, D.C. But what you have to keep in mind is our nation's capital actually bounced around for quite a bit. Our nation's capital was housed in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, York, Pennsylvania, New York, New York, and a couple of other places as well. So this was actually a major point of argument. While we're creating this new government, where should our new government be seated? Well, as far as the northern states were concerned, very much represented by Alexander Hamilton, they wanted to see our nation's capital in New York or Philadelphia. At the same time, they wanted our national government to assume all of the state debts that had incurred during the Revolutionary War. This is part of Alexander Hamilton's plan that where he was standing is that since the states incurred these debts during a fight for our liberty, it should be the nation's as a whole problem to pay off. Now, as far as Hamilton was concerned, having our nation's capital in these northern states and assuming these debts would help our standing throughout the world, all right? And hopefully make countries want to deal with the United States as a whole instead of the individual states. Well, Thomas Jefferson in the South very much feared the capital being in the North would lead to the basically favoring northern interests. He had the, the, the true thought that wherever the capital was placed would be the states that had the most influence over what happened in our nation's capital. A second issue he took was actually with the idea of repaying war debts. Most of the Southern states had already been actively repaying their war debts. And so they were like, if we have the nation as a whole assume all of our debts, that now means we have to chip in to pay off other states' debts. And that's kind of not our problem. We've already done our fair share. <laughs> 
Uh, for you guys that are big Hamilton the Musical fans, this is your Hamilton cabinet battle number one. So, guys, here's a huge argument, all right? We have this concept of if we put the nation's capital in one place or another, that'll give one region of the nation more control over the decisions happening in the Congress, in the House, the presidency. So how does one come to a compromise? Well, in this particular case, we see what's known as a compromise of 1790. And it's actually rather interesting why they did this. This compromise gave everybody a little bit of something they wanted. Now, first and foremost, it actually put the capital officially, quote unquote, in the South. Both Maryland and Virginia would actually give or cede property to the national government to create what's known as the District of Columbia. You'll notice this in the bottom left-hand graphic. Now, in its original design, Washington, D.C. was a perfect diamond that sat along the Potomac River. We'll get into the, what happens there later. Now, the idea of creating this new district was essentially then that the capital would not officially be in any state. It would just be regionally positioned in the South. And because it wasn't actually located within any particular state, it meant that no state could be shown favoritism when decisions were being made by our government. Now, in exchange for this geographic location in this Southern region, the South did in the end agree to help the government assume all war debt, essentially agreeing to help the North repay their debts as a nation as a whole. And finally, issue four, how can we guarantee that this new strong government would not overstep its bounds and infringe upon the rights of the people? This was actually a huge concern of Thomas Jefferson's because when you look at the writing in the constitution and articles one, two, and three, there's a lot of discussion of the establishment of government, but what's not really discussed straight up is what's going to happen with the people's rights. Well, the anti-federalists believe that the new constitution needed a list of rights to guarantee this to their citizens for the fear of what if a strong government behaves like the old king. As far as the likes of Sam Adams and Patrick Henry are concerned, if it wasn't written in the Constitution, then people could take advantage of the fact that it hasn't been said straight up. While Federalists, on the other hand, by the likes, of course, of Alexander Hamilton, um, you know, Madison and Jay, they believe that the Constitution was well in the system of providing a checks and balance between the three branches of government. So the system of checks and balances would offer that protection to all the individuals involved. And their concern was that if we actually attempt to list all the rights people have, well, how do we make sure that we don't forget some? And if they're not listed and others are, does that mean that those can be taken advantage of? So rather than list anything, isn't it just better not to list any than to try to list them all? Well, lo and behold, at the end of the day, the Anti-Federalists did in fact get their compromise with the addition at a later date of the Bill of Rights. Now this Bill of Rights would be created by Thomas Jefferson and essentially is a list of our guaranteed freedoms. These are our natural born rights. And these are rights that can never be taken away. I'm gonna to touch on that here in a second. Now these 10 rights were added to the Constitution as amendments. And these are changes that have been made to the Constitution. Now, what you guys have to understand, though, that statement above that says these are rights that can never be taken away. Believe it or not, it's actually written into the Constitution that your rights are only guaranteed and your freedoms are only guaranteed in that you may act upon your rights as long as it doesn't take away the rights of someone else.